each and every one of our participants and especially our guest, uh, Sumesh Sumaru, who is the Durban partner of BDO. And of course, Nadine Ricks, uh, who is in Cape Town uh, and she is on risk. Our topic for today is, our, on, is, um, is your business well prepared to deal with the economic impact of COVID-19? Now, that is very topical, as you know, and uh, I'm sure our uh, uh, participants uh, mm -hmm. would like to know what could they do uh, to mitigate uh, situations in, in COVID-19. At this stage, I'd like to thank uh, Fahim Hussein and Deborah for facilitating this particular uh, uh, Zoom presentation that we're having on BDO. Um, thank you, Fahim and uh, Deborah. I know you're there as well. Um, <coughs> due to, yeah, hello. Now, mm -hmm. due to the limited time constraints that we have, uh, I'm just going to say that BDO is an international player in every aspect of business management. Its roots go as far back as I think 1910, when Seedman and Seedman were founded. And that was well, I think in the union days, that kind of thing, uh, when South Africa was just about, uh, got its uh, independence. And since then, there have been several mergers and somewhere probably in the 80s, I think that BDO was finally named. Now, I don't want to say too much about the BDO because, I mean, we got the experts there and I'll now hand you over to Samaru, who will give you a small message and after which he will introduce the main speaker for this evening, that is Nadine Ricks. And at the end of Nadine's presentation, uh, dear uh, listeners, uh, just before we wrap up, I'll give you an opportunity to ask the panel any questions and they'll be more than happy to respond on that. So with those few words, I'd like to hand over to Sumesh, over to you, and then, yeah, you can run with it. Thanks. Thanks, Razak. Thanks for that introduction. Uh, just on behalf of BDO, uh, we'd like to thank the Manara Chamber of Commerce for giving us the opportunity to partner with them on this webinar. And we look forward to working with the guys on many more webinars in the future. Just a bit about BDO for the guys that don't know. Uh, BDO in South Africa provides audit, advisory, and tax services to a broad range of clients from large JSE listed companies to small and medium sized entities. I'm just going to give you a scale of the size of BDO internationally firstly and then bring it down to the Durban level. So, internationally, we operate in 167 countries and territories. We have 88,000 people that work for BDO globally over 1,600 offices, and our annual global revenue is 9.6 billion US dollars. From a South African context, we operate from nine offices in South Africa. We've got 1,700 staff that support our clients across all the services that we offer. We do a 1.3 billion rand turnover, and we have about 130 odd partners and staff, which is changing on a monthly basis as the firm grows uh, locally. I think more importantly, from a KZN perspective, uh, in KZN, we have 10 partners. Uh, the partners provide a range of services, uh, focusing on audit, uh, advisory, and tax. Uh, we play in all sectors in KZN, so the partners are skilled to advise and audit in all the major sectors in, uh, of the economy, except financial services, which is run from our Johannesburg office. We are ably supported by a group of associate directors and managers in other service lines uh, that complement us. And on this slide here, you see we have a divisional head in each sector, be it accounting, tax, audit, we have an AD as well. We also have a wealth division in KZN. We have Statuco, which is a company secretarial division and company governance division. And then we offer, also offer BE verification services. So the Durban team is quite sizable. Uh, we have a staff complement of about 190 staff and it's growing. We expect that to go to about 200 next year. Uh, BDO, what we're striving to be, uh, we are striving to become a much larger BDO and to be seen as the only viable alternative to the large firms. And we also want to partner with clients whose ambition is looking to grow. 
uh, we aim to become one of the true powerhouses of the mid-tier, and I think we are there at the moment. Uh, we are probably the leading mid-tier in South Africa at the moment. Uh, with that, uh, we very still remain true to our roots. Uh, we're very partner-centric and partner-focused. So dealing with BDO means that you would get, you know, first-hand partner experience. Oh, in all you with us. I'm just going to move over now to introducing our speaker for today, uh, Nadine Ricks. Nadine Ricks is based in our Cape Town office. She has more than 20 years experience, of which 13 was spent living and working in West Africa. She started a career as an article clerk in 2000, and after finishing articles, she was appointed as a management accountant for an international company in Johannesburg. In 2004, she left South Africa to pursue an expatriate appointment in Nigeria, where she took on the position as a head of business risk management for a major telecommunications company. And during her time in Nigeria, her team won awards for team excellence and culture. In 2009, she relocated to Accra, Ghana to start her own consulting and training company. In the nine years in Ghana, she trained over 8,000 people across various sectors in the areas of leadership and management. She organized team building events and virtually coached executives of leading multinational companies. Her client list includes SMEs and multinationals across a variety of industries, including banking, oil, gas, telecommunications, NGOs, and hospitality. Before returning home to South Africa in 2017, she was project advisory to a team of professionals responsible for the restructuring and revamping of the oil refinery in Ghana, making the refinery profitable for the first time in nine years. Back in South Africa, she's been heavily involved in the development of female entrepreneurs through the course Ideas to Impact. She currently holds the position of National Risk Officer for BDO South Africa where she's responsible for the overall strategic and operational risk management. With that, I hand you over to Nadine. Thank you very much uh, for that introduction. Uh, evening, everybody. I'm going to try and just quickly share my, my screen here. Uh, if you'll allow me just some time to, to get organized. Um, all right. So, Okay, we can see can the I maybe just get a, a thumbs up, you can see it? Fantastic, all right, yeah. okay, great. I'm gonna leave my uh, video off for the sake of uh, sharing and, and buffering so that we don't run into trouble there. Uh, evening, everybody. I really appreciate everyone making the time to, to attend this workshop. I know many of you, like myself, we've got children and we're trying to balance work from home. Uh, we're seemingly less hours in the day. I'm also aware that many of us are starting to suffer from web fatigue and information overload and a general feeling of being zoomed out. So thank you, Samesh and uh, Razak for the introductions and for giving me the honor of presenting you tonight. Uh, just some housekeeping, there is a comment section on the side. Uh, we will have a Q&A afterwards uh, where I'll be happy to take uh, any questions or, or comments uh, after the presentation. And with that, let's start talking about safeguarding our businesses against the economic risks that the pandemic has brought on. Now, as Sumesh mentioned, I uh, was introduced to risk management probably in one of the most risky places in the world, being Nigeria. And what I learned there not only changed my life, but it gave me a very different perspective of the world, in particular human and, and organizational behavior. So seeing as we are dealing with such a complex topic, let's start by clarifying the set of to make Total sure that we're all on, on the same page. So when we look at risk, uh, it's typically defined as the possibility that something can go wrong. Uh, it involves uncertainty about the effects or implications of an activity with respect to something that humans value, such as health, well-being, wealth, uh, property, or the environment, often focusing on the ne negative or undesirable consequences. So you might be wondering about my choice of picture. This was a common sight during my time in Nigeria and it always reminded me of how we're all different and how our decisions are driven by our risk tolerance, stuff that was unique to all of us. And, and oftentimes it's driven by our circumstance or lack of alternatives. If we can agree that risk is the possibility of a negative occurrence, uh, most people in business will typically evaluate two things, uh, the likelihood of it occurring and the impact if it does. 
Typical risk models have shown us that uh, likelihood times impact will give us some sort of a scoring. And based on that, the organization will then decide how they want to treat these risks. Now, this is where the tolerance levels or risk acceptance levels will, will come into play. Many of us won't get, get on the taxi or in the taxi. We'll save and buy a car that can afford us a safety belt. But the risk tolerances and organizations will then typically uh, lead them to a decision on how they want to treat these risks. Uh, they will either try to avoid them completely uh, or they'll accept it and uh, then they'll try and mitigate the impact or implement some loss prevention strategies or loss reduction. Or in the case of economics, we would typically then transfer it in the form of insurance or outsourcing it. <coughs> Excuse me. But when we look at economic risks specifically, here we look at things like uh, economic growth, interest rate changes, exchange rate changes. Uh, employment levels. And we all know that some organizations have adapted very well in the pandemic. And yes, let's face it, we can't get away from the fact that we are in a dire humanitarian crisis. But if you're really honest with each other, the economic issues that we are facing are not necessarily new. They've, they've always been there. Agreed, they've been elevated and brought forward on the national agenda, but the South African political and economical arena has been unstable and rifled with corruption for years. Our interest rates and rent fluctuates in great degrees with any kind of global event that takes place. And our unemployment numbers and skills shortages and education challenges have been part of the State of the Nation address for years. Just in February, our president prioritized the digitization of education, so the chances are that these things have been on our risk registers and part of our strategic planning, but most likely now that the impact has been more dire, they've moved into the high category. I mean, maybe they were medium or even low. But if you do business in South Africa, you've already accepted these risks. We can try now to put additional controls in place and try to mitigate the effect, but I believe we need a different approach to our traditional ways of risk management. We need okay. to start building organizational resilience so that we can adapt and change in order to move forward and through this pandemic. But before we go into doing things differently, let's evaluate why we should do them differently. And, and maybe let's look at some of the things that we've missed. <clears throat> if we say that slow economic growth has been in our risk registers, and uh, yes, it's likely, maybe we underestimated the impact of this extent, but let's face it, very few organizations took the risk of a pandemic seriously. I say this because the entire world was caught off guard. It's not just the South African economy that's taking a hit, it's happening worldwide. So maybe we fail to recognize two elements of risk, the one being speed of onset, or we can call it uh, velocity. This refers to the time it takes for a risk event to manifest itself. In other words, the time that lapses from the occurrence of the event and the point at which the company first feels it. Now, the pandemic broke out in November 2019, and by March, the entire South Africa had come to a complete shutdown and standstill. Overnight, we felt the effects of this. By any measure, that is an incredibly rapid manifestation. The second element we can look at then is vulnerability. So vulnerability refers to how prepared uh, the organization is for that event. We look here at things like agility, adaptability, and the more vulnerable the higher the impact of this event will be. Here we look at things like scenario planning and our capabilities to respond and adapt quickly as events unfold and organizations resilience as a whole. And here is where resilient organizations, those have been able to adapt and change, have managed to recover, while most of us are still grappling with the daily events. I believe the reason for the lack in organizational resilience or the reason why most organizations are still grappling with this reality is because of what we've been taught in business schools and leadership workshops for years. The models of organizational strategy and risk management have been in place for years. We're all too familiar once a year when the strategic planning session comes around and we whip out our tried and tested SWOT models and our pestle analysis. We might throw in uh, Porter's five forces just for fun. And uh, for risk management, we turn to our COSA models of ISO 31000, and we use the same tools that we've been using for decades. This, even though the world around us has been changing at a very rapid pace, even pre-pandemic, we've stuck to the traditional ways of evaluating business and developing our leaders. And here's the kicker. All of these tools rely on a fundamental assumption 
of organizational theory and practice, which is that a certain level of predictability and order exists in the world. Most of us have been trained in environments that are stable and predictable. Yes, there's risk, but we've always felt a certain comfort level within our own ability to manage it. The problem that this has created is that it's left us with a society, people in our workplace, that have a default setting where we thrive when there's a sense of stability, predictability, and order. We've been trained that way, and businesses have been built on these assumptions. And most of the models till date exist so that we can create order and put things into nice boxes, things that make sense. However, as our circumstances have become more complex, they are inadequate to deal with our environments. And here's where we need to start thinking differently. The complexity that has arose from COVID needs a different style of leadership, a different way of running our organizations, and we need to form a new perspective based on all of these complexities. So <clears throat> let's go back to our typical risk register as an example. We might say it might look something like this. So a lot of us would have had a pandemic on our risk register. But because the likelihood was low, uh, it would typically get a very low risk rating. Uh, many organizations have supply chain disruption. Uh, because we diversify our supplier base, it could be a low risk. Slow economic growth could be medium. And an inability to attract skills, this is also a very popular occurrence on a risk register, could be medium as well. So let's just take this as an example. Nice, easy boxes. We can manage them. We can put controls in place. Uh, and we can feel good about our ability to manage them. Now, if I add complexity to this, where I overlay the risks on top of each other and I start doing a bit of scenario planning, yeah. I realize that I need a bit more information. So what effect will a pandemic have on my supply chain? Do I even know how diverse my supply chain is? Did we see the slowdown in economic growth, not only in South Africa, but worldwide? And what happens now to my inability to attract skills? Do I still need those skills? Or do I now need completely different skills? Do I even know what skills I have? And the same goes for you know, all the other factors. Once we start overlaying them, this complexity comes out and we realize very quickly that it's messy. It's very messy. And that's where a lot of us find ourselves now. The good news is that dealing with complexity is not a new field. Complexity theory dates back to the 1999s, where the Kinevan framework was first introduced by Dave Snowden, who at that stage was working for IBM, um, and he came up with this framework. So it's been around for 20 years, and it's meant to help us to understand the relational aspects of cause and effect across four domains. The idea is that once we assess our situation, we can more accurately respond. So the model starts by the simple uh, domain. This is where we sense something, uh, we categorize it, and we respond. Uh, to take a very simplified example, if I take my car, uh, you know, once that oil light comes on or once the petrol gauge light comes on, I know I need to go to the petrol station and I fill up my car, uh, categorize it, and I respond by taking my car to the filling station. So typically in the simple domain, this is process driven activities and in most cases can be rectified without much management or leadership intervention. When we move to the next state, which is complicated, <clears throat> this is where our car will break down. So we can't fix it, but we might need an expert to help us to analyze it. We need a bit more information, so we'll take it to a mechanic uh, and they can also then with a bit of analysis help us to respond appropriately. Now these two domains are the audit domains. In the unordered section, this is where we look at chaos. So chaos is where we typically act first. You know, the car is on fire, get out, jump. We can later on figure out what happened and maybe investigate a bit and then respond through getting insurance and things like that. But chaos is where we act immediately. And this is where world leaders have acted very differently in response to the pandemic. Some went into complete lockdown. Uh, some said, no, nothing is wrong. And we're now in a, in a space where we can start seeing what worked and what didn't work by sensing what is going on around us. Some have changed their responses to go into full lockdown only now. So this is that chaotic state that we've been in for quite some time. Complexity now is where I take my car to the mechanic, but he needs to fix it while I'm driving. So here the cause and effect is not evident. In most cases, we only see the effects after the event like we're all seeing now in the economic damage. 
We didn't see it in the beginning. Lots of things are going on. It's very complex, but only after a while can we now start seeing what's going on. And in that time, we need to probe for information. We need to find out what is all being affected. So complex contexts are often unpredictable. Uh, the best approach here, as you can see, is to probe, ask questions, figure out, go to the root cause, sense, and then respond. Rather than trying to control the situation or insisting on a plan of action, it's often best to be patient, look for pattern, and encourage the solutions to change. Now, this is where we find most of the businesses. So what can a business do to help it move through this complexity? In the probing phase, this is where we need to, things, to do things like experiment, um, innovate, different kinds of problem solving. And the biggest thing that leaders need to accept, the managers need to accept, is that failure is part of the learning process. Organizations that fail to learn or that think they know everything are gonna fall out the bus here. So if we take small steps in a safe environment, we can experiment with the problem and view the results then. If the results lead us closer to a solution, then we do more of the same thing. If the results don't move us closer to a solution, we try something else. Uh, you can, if you want, in organizations set some guide rooms. It's always nice to have some guidance, not just have a bunch of people brainstorm in a room. Um, but this is where we really need to start thinking outside the box. Now, the thing is, if, if the Kunivan framework has been around for 20 years, why are we still so lost? The problem is, though, that even if we know all of this, history has unfortunately shown us that we don't always learn from our mistakes. We wait for order to return. How many of you have heard this, uh, I can't wait for things to go back to normal? Majority of us would rather wait and looks towards external forces to drive the change. You know, we're waiting for the borders to open. We're waiting for air travel to go back. We're waiting for things to normalize instead of actually doing something ourselves. So, for example, unemployment is a huge economic factor and a huge challenge. And many of my, my clients will, will hate the fact that I've given this advice to them before. But to say, instead of letting people go, we had this knee-jerk reaction. So many organizations had to let people go and cut costs. What if we gave them an opportunity to come up with innovative, creative solutions to complex problems? We all know South Africans, we don't have a lack of, of entrepreneurs and creative thinkers. What if we kept our staff and asked them to find ways to make us money? We know that South Africans sitting at home are all looking to see, well, how can they make more money? What if we have a, a forum or a hub in our organizations where these employees can get together, uh, come up with different business plans. It doesn't even have to be in line with your strategy, as long as it's aligned with the organizational purpose. But what if we can then have them present their business plans and those that we like, let's test them. That gives them the, the network to support them. Let's give them the tools to support them. It's not going to cost us a lot of money. And at the end of the day, it can help us to build our brand. So each of these things that we do, we can do it in a safe space, but we have to be able to learn and do things very differently. One of the main things that underpin this is our need for data. We need to be able to, when we come up with results or when we come up with a plan, we need to be able to see what effect is it having. And for that, we need data. And that's kind of where it brings me to the framework that we've uh, kind of designed for developing organizational resilience. When it comes to, to COVID, I spend a lot of time thinking, you know, <sighs> How do we build resilience in organizations? It's, it's such a personal thing. You know, there's so much written about personal resilience and people moving through adversity. So I started by evaluating what an organization, what a resilient organization would look like, i.e., what would the characteristics be? And then I simply answered the question, what is needed for organizations to build resilience? Uh, if you've been following the recent trends in advisory and the risk space, you'll know that at the forefront of giving organizations advice is how to deal with on how to deal with COVID has been the collection of data and digitization. Every second article on the internet speaks of data and digitization, and for good reason. Data can help us to understand all the factors in our environment, and by having the right tech in place, it can help us to deal with the complexity around us. And our framework for resilience is no different in that data is one of the three foundational elements in building organizational resilience. By developing our use of data, systems and processes, Organizations can start to move away from an over-reliance on leaders and managers to micromanage, as we need our leaders to do things like communicate, motivate, build trust, realign our strategy, and think creatively. Our leaders also need time to build their tolerance for uncertainty, as I don't think that things will be normal anytime soon. 
So when we look at data, <clears throat> I don't know how many of you have, you know, tried to do some analysis in your organization. You get three Excel spreadsheets and they're all saved in different formats. You know, the date formats don't agree or you ask for client listing and you get things where something is saved as, you know, BDO limited and sometimes it's just BDO Inc. You know, there's different naming conventions or PTY limited or closed corporation. The data is messy. I've spent my fair share of time trying to clean up the data before I can actually do something with it. Um, a significant portion of organizational data that's collected is also either trivial or irrelevant with no business value whatsoever. Um, and oftentimes it can't be read by the systems. So research by uh, recently done by Gartner indicated uh, that poor data quality is estimated to cost organizations in the US an average of $50 million in losses a year. Data workers are estimated to waste about 44% of their time each week on data preparation alone. Now, we can all agree that that's time that could be much better spent on doing analysis to yield insights. So when we look at data, we need to ensure that whatever we're capturing is relevant. Do we need this? Is it accurate? Can everybody access it? What format is it saved in? You know, we don't want to spend hours cleaning up Excel spreadsheets where we could actually just be doing data analysis. Of course, the data integrity needs to be well maintained. Um, and these days we can't hear enough of privacy, uh, data protection and, and privacy and safety, make sure that it's being kept safe. So these are all the domains that we look at in terms of collecting data. So once we have the data that's relevant, it's clean, we can work with it. We then move on to systems and processes. So systems and processes are the essential building blocks of every company. It's all the activities that make things work together that help us to add value, to provide value. Now, when we look at systems and processes in resilience, systems and processes help us to analyze the data. They've got to be intelligent and they've got to inform us on what decisions to take. We can build alert systems in place. So for example, if I look at COVID, um, let's say we had supply chain disruption. Did I have an alert that would show me which of my suppliers were most severely impacted? If there's a change in regulation, do I know which suppliers are being impacted? Same goes for clients. Uh, do I even know how many of my clients have been impacted or how they've been impacted or to what extent they've been impacted and the knock-on effect to my business? Same goes for regulatory changes. If there's a change in regulation tonight, do I know the knock-on effect by tomorrow morning that it's going to have on my business? Or am I running around as a manager or as a leader trying to figure out you know, the impact of this? Am I wasting my time trying to make sense of it? Where if I have proper data in place and proper systems and processes in place, I can actually work towards, you know, communicating it, putting people at ease and, you know, work in the organization on that way where I can really add value. Uh, one of the things I've also looked at, you know, in, in the time of BDO and of, of COVID, I actually started a parenting workshop or sessions, you call it that, parent support group for parents that was now all of a sudden thrust into home education. I don't say homeschooling because I do think homeschooling kind of implies that there was some sort of choice involved. Um, and what was amazing when I started the parent support groups is how many people were actually willing to offer assistance in the form of uh, online teaching. We had uh, people who were studying towards their teaching degrees that said, you know, if you have to work, I'm available, I can do grade seven and grade eight uh, science. We had grannies that have been homeschooling grandchildren, our partners in BDO saying, you know, I currently have an eight-year-old that I homeschool. Uh, I can do online sessions for younger kids. So when it comes to systems, we can apply this to our workforce. You know, do we know what is currently going in in our workforce? Do we have data around their skills, their capabilities, their flexibility? Can they work from home? Or are we just asking them to do more in the time that we're in because we're waiting for the schooling system to go back to normal? So the way that I like seeing data and, and systems interact is, is data only qualifies um, when we can make an informed decision of it. So all the facts that I accumulate, they don't qualify as information until they inform. Um, and to transfer data into information, we use the systems and processes and our leaders use this to, to start making sense of what is going on around them. Business schools and organizations equip our leaders to operate in the ordered domains, simple and complicated. But most leaders usually must rely on their natural capabilities when operating in unordered context. In the face of greater complexity today, you know, we, 
we are seeing people using intuition, uh, uh, you know, gut feelings, uh, but these days that's no longer enough. We need to have the tools and approaches to guide our firms through less familiar waters. And this is where what's on the screen now becomes so important that we know the data we need to collect, it, we can transfer it into information using systems and processes, and we can start making sense of what is going on around us. The last element then I have is trust. Um, for me, this is, this is absolutely paramount. This is probably the most important uh, in the framework, or most important foundation in the framework. Trust has become such a powerful organizational asset. It brings a sense of confidence and belief in organizations, which in turn enables other things to happen. It's an absolute vital foundation for any business long-term survival and success. The way that trust and resilience kind of play together is Trust is critical to agility and transformation because it helps us to move through disruption and adversity. I'm not necessarily going to come up with innovative ideas or mention out the box suggestions if I don't trust the people I work with, nor are the public going to accept a new innovation or a new pro product that comes from me if they don't trust me. Trusted brands can now innovate and the consumers are more likely to take up what they're selling because there is trust. So it helps us to navigate through disruption. The sharing of knowledge becomes very easy. If I trust the people I work with, if I trust my organization, if I trust my manager, I trust my team, this facilitates a higher quality of knowledge exchange, problem solving, decision making and ultimately performance. Um, we can also see that's where I come back to brand. You know, if we have an established brand, an established reputation that's built on that trust, that flows to the external community. Shareholders want to invest in us. Customers want to buy our products. People want to support us because we've built up a reputation for trust. And then at the end of the day, it makes it very difficult to copy trust. If it's a competitive advantage, um, it's a very difficult thing for our competitors to replicate if they don't already have it. And we can through that then become the trusted brand. We can become the choice that everybody will have at the end of the day. They will choose us because they know us. They know what we stand for. They know our purpose. They believe in what we believe. So when we look at trust, like I said, personally for me, um, this is one of the most important foundations in the framework. And for me, it all goes back to our why the purpose behind our actions, the purpose why our organizations exist. It's the foundation that guides our actions. And when people see us behaving in a manner that emulates our passion, they'll follow us and they'll stay loyal to us. We can only do this by engaging in open, honest conversations with our staff, customers, suppliers, banks, and by remaining true to our purpose, we can build resilient businesses, not just to survive the current pandemic, but to build something that will sustain the fluctuating space we're in. We have to focus on relationships and honesty. Can you imagine, instead of, you know, cutting down or squeezing our supplies in this time, we actually went to them and we said, you know what, we're struggling for cash. We want to keep doing business with you. We're in a really difficult space. We're not just going to squeeze you out and go for the cheap alternative. We want to not have unemployment. We don't want to cut jobs. By squeezing our suppliers, they might have to cut jobs. So what if we can engage in open and honest discussions with our suppliers to say, you know what, we want to keep paying you the price because we believe that, you know, we believe in the same things. We want to help people. We want to deliver good products and services, whatever your why is. So instead of having that knee jerk reaction of cost cutting, of layoffs, is there a different way in which we can do this? Is, you know, instead of laying off our staff, can we repurpose them? Are there critical skills in there that might grow us to the next level? Are we walking the floor and finding out what people are doing and how we can help them? So by enabling our leaders to get comfortable in uncertainty, these bonds can get stronger. It's a very, very complex world that we're in and leaders will have to know how to operate in it, but they need to start being open, transparent, flexible and adaptable. We need to do things differently. So by remaining true to our purpose, I think we can serve our why by changing the way in which we do it. Our purpose will stay the same, but obviously our strategy execution has now changed vastly, but it needs to be more flexible, adaptable, and transparent. We don't have to have all the answers. We don't need to have all the answers, but we need to stay true to what we believe so we can create strong connections, foster a relationship that builds loyalty and community. And that for me personally, in turn, will secure our resilience
and help us to move forward through this pandemic because there is surely a lot of uncertainty still around the corner. It's with that that I am now finished. I'm very glad I finished within my half an hour. I was quite nervous that I wasn't going to make it. I'm really, really passionate about this topic. Um, and I hope that we have some uh, questions. Uh, if I can open up the, the chat box. I'm not too sure how we do this. I'm going to open up the chat box. Uh, and I hope that we can get the, the discussions going. Um, yeah, thanks, Nadine. That was excellent. I'm glad that I'm actually sitting at home this evening, <laughs> relaxed, because no way I could have done, you know, uh, given, given the kind of attention to this uh, subject uh, during work hours. Uh, <laughs> and it's quite Thank interesting, you. though. And uh, I, I must say that I picked up quite a bit uh, of tips there. Um, yeah, uh, let's open it to the floor and... Uh, uh, I, as, uh, like you, Nadine, I hope that we have some stimulating yes. discussion and uh, interactive uh, uh, discussions now. Yes. So thank you. open to the floor. Is there anybody that uh, has, like, I'll, I'll restrict it to about 10 questions, not more than that. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Is it... <clears throat> Hi, it's Sipo here. Yeah? Hi, yeah. it's Sipo here. Sipo, yes, Sipo. Yes. Well, yeah, thanks. Please, yeah. please go ahead. Thanks, Nadine. And then, you know what, uh, what you have said, it, it's something that as an individuals and then as people and then looking at the time that we are in during the COVID, it's something mm -hmm. that we needed all of us to hear it. Thank you. And, <laughs> and as a package as is, thanks for packaging so well. But the only thing that I wanted to find out from you, hmm. for, an, each, for an individual or for companies, what really needed from us to be relevant to the future? Because mm -hmm. the fact is, life will never be the same mm -hmm. as, as, as anymore. And then doing things have already been, mm -hmm. doing the, the traditional thing that you used to do things have already mm -hmm. changed altogether. For mm -hmm. us to be relevant, and then for us to invest in the future, what one must take to do that? Thank you, Sipo. I, I absolutely love, I love your question because, you know, it, it, it starts with us. It, it starts with us as individuals. And I think my, my question as a, your question has a two-part answer for me. Personally, I've, I've spent a lot of time over the years um, to, Oh, I see you. I must share my video. Hang on, hang on. Sorry, Sipo. Let me just quickly uh, start video. I don't know if anybody can see me. <laughs> um, so I, I think, Sipo, for me, you know, as I said, it, 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 it's such a relevant question. And I love the fact that you said, you know, how can we remain relevant? Uh, it's not just, you know, how can we make more money or how can we do this or how can we do that? Um, I think for me personally, I've done a lot of, work over the years in trying to find out what is my purpose. So why am I here? What am I meant to be doing? And then I actively seek out the fulfillment of that purpose with the people I engage with and the organizations that I work for. So I think I always start with what is it that I enjoy doing? What am I here to do? And what I found that if we find our purpose, it kind of it helps us to move through adversity because if we're running around unsure of what we're doing and why we're doing it, we run out of energy very quickly. Whereas if we engage in activities that give us fulfillment, it manages to sustain us. And especially in the time of COVID, we need that. We need activities that will sustain our motivation, that will sustain our, sustain our levels of energy. So for me, I think remaining relevant would, would first be to uncover your purpose. What is it that you enjoy doing? Do you enjoy learning or teaching? Um, is it data analytics? Is it Excel? Is it accounting? Where can you really fulfill that purpose? I think from the organizational context, um, if I can move on to the second part of my answer, I think organizations in terms of remaining relevant really need to gain an in-depth understanding of how they can serve their communities. 
we can't get away from the fact that this is ultimately a humanitarian crisis. Um, it's not for profit anymore. It needs to serve a higher purpose. We need to put people first. And for me, people plus purpose will equal profits at the end of the day. I think we need to go back to our clients, figure out exactly what it is that they need from us, um, figure out how we can serve them differently. Um, and, I go to the, and I go to the example of the schooling because I'm in it. Um, you know, the schools, most of the people that I've spoken to have not been really supportive or sympathetic to the fact that you're dealing with working parents who have organizations that demand them to work eight hour days. So what are you doing to help me take care of my kids in this time? You know, that's a basic thing. Organizations as well. Are we doing something to really give our parents at home flexible hours or are we giving them other solutions of how to do things? So I think if we start putting people first, that's going to be the thing that keeps us relevant going forward. It's not necessarily going to be the popular profit choice, um, but I do think if we go that and, and we follow our purpose, the profits will flow from that. I'm a big believer in that. I, I hope that I managed to, to answer your question. If not, <laughs> maybe even probe another one. <laughs> No, thanks. I, I'm happy that, and then you nailed it, and then, yeah. But lastly, I wanted to find out any possibility to get the recordings of your presentation or the presentation uh, itself? I think so. Um, I'm not sure. I think... Uh, yes. It will be yes, yeah, Razak? yes. Yes, we would actually be um, sending those recordings out to all the participants or for okay. those who that need it really, okay. but, but I'm sure okay. uh, our officers will be able to send the uh, recordings to all who, who, who are on the okay. show. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, other, <laughs> other questions? Okay. If there are none, then... Uh, I think maybe we uh, are at the end of the show and I'd just like to make some closing remarks. Um, may I, on behalf of uh, uh, Minara Chamber of Commerce, take this opportunity of thanking BDO and the delegates of Sumesh uh, Sumaru and of course Nadine yourself for a very stimulating and very informative discussion on risk management. I want to thank all the participants for their kind attention and uh, <laughs> I must apologize in advance if your dinner has gone cold uh, <laughs> it was not my fault anyway. um, as you say as I said should you need further info on video please feel free to contact uh, the Minara Chamber of Commerce on telephone number 031-208-1898 or email to kzn at minara.org.za. Um, I want to wish you all a pleasant evening ahead and uh, hope you keep safe for the rest of the year. All the best. If there's nothing else, I think we should then close the, uh, the presentation. Thanks to all. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, Nadine.